recent book. Um, this was actually very kindly mentioned just now by Maria. It's actually my um, most recent book. So Ciudad Hambrientas, in fact, came out in 2008, quite a long time ago. Um, but this is a kind of continuation of that book and the thinking in it. And maybe the most important idea I had during that book in which I was examining what it takes to feed a city is that, uh, you know, we live in a world shaped by food. And I thought we needed to have a, a, a name to describe this phenomenon. So I invented the word Cytopia. Um, and Cytopia just means food place. And it's from the Greek Cytos uh, for food and Topos for place. And why did I invent this word? Well, as I said, when I was researching my book, Hungry City, I realized that the question of how to eat is probably the most profound question that we face as humans. And it always has been. In fact, I think it's fair to say that we evolved as a species through this shared question of how to eat and trying to use various technologies, use our inventiveness to get better and better at doing it. Um, and of course, this picture here, which I love, um, of the Hadza in Tanzania, which are one of the few groups in the world who still live through hunter gathering, um, is that they're sitting around a fire. And of course, you know, the invention of fire and learning how to control fire was a pivotal moment in our history. You know, a moment when we, well, basically discovered how to cook food. And uh, what's interesting when you cook food is that you can take on energy from your food much more quickly. And this allowed our ancestors to specialize in hunting, which meant they could eat higher value foods like meat. Um, the reason being that if they were unsuccessful in the hunt, they would still have a backup meal uh, in the form of cooked tubers and therefore they could go hunting every day and not only occasionally. So our brains got bigger, our diet got bigger and we became social beings around the fire as well because the shared meal in hunter-gatherer societies is what I often say is the first and best human economy. We're very good at sharing through food. We evolved language in order to do it better. And of course the fire itself was really the beginning of staying in a place and sort of having a sense of belonging and home and, and sort of sociability in the landscape. So it really is the beginning, both of our sort of sense of ourselves, our sense of, our sense of ourselves as a community and our sense of, you know, being, being able to manipulate the world in a sense. So very, very many things come from this early image. And of course, the question of how to eat profoundly shapes how we live. Um, and for most of history, you know, humans have probably been around in the world for about two million years. And for most of that time, we lived as hunter-gatherers, We, which means we live directly in nature. Um, and in fact, it's no accident that uh, Many uh, traditions, not only the Bible actually, or sort of creation myths, describe this existence as a sort of paradise, because actually hunter-gatherer life was pretty good. Um, people followed the food around, or they moved around a territory, and of course they lived directly in nature, which was, uh, you know, in, in many senses, a very wonderful way to live. Um, and indeed, when we began farming, uh, part of the reason that uh, farming is portrayed as a punishment in the Bible is that it was much harder work to eat this way. Um, so you then have to ask the question, OK, why did we start farming? Uh, and the answer to that is that we had no choice. In fact, it's very interesting that uh, we began to farm, you know, concentrate on farming as a way of feeding ourselves. Uh, at the end of the last ice age, uh, about 12,000 years ago, which is effectively the last major climate crisis or major climate change uh, that the world has undergone. And what happened is that the lush, I mean, by the way, this area here, it's called the Fertile Crescent. 
It's in the ancient Near East. Uh, so you're looking obviously at the, uh, what is modern day Iraq um, and on the right and Jordan on the left. Um, and it's an area where uh, that was the real life Garden of Eden. This is the, the part of the world that the Garden of Eden actually represented. And in fact, what it was, was an extremely fertile area, that, which is why it's called the Fertile Crescent, where the ancient antecedents of our modern grains, wheat and barley naturally occurred. So people gradually, as the climate change occurred, as the forests began to recede northwards, as the world heated up, people were looking for a new way of feeding themselves. And they had the, the bright idea, if you like, of, of concentrating on eating grain and planting seeds and waiting for them to ripen. And of course, if you are going to do that, if you're going to invest a lot of work in, in a piece of ground, you know, by cultivating it and by planting seeds, then you're not going to wander off like the hunter gatherers did. In fact, you're going to want to stay in one place and look after your crops. So we slowly get the evolution of static agricultural settlements up the Eastern Mediterranean seaboard uh, in what is modern Turkey up here. And then crucially in this group of uh, settlements in the ancient Mesopotamia, um, which are complex enough to be considered true cities. So really what I want to, you know, the idea that I want to give you with this slide is that farming and urbanity co-evolved uh, and you can't have one without the other. And that grain uh, was the food of early cities and indeed has always been, it still remains today, the food of cities. So what did those early cities look like? Well, if we look at one of the group I just showed you, we can immediately notice several things. Uh, the city itself is very small, it's very dense, and it's surrounded by countryside. Um, and I actually call this the fried egg model of urbanity, because if you think of a fried egg, you have the yolk of the egg in the middle, and then the white of the egg is the countryside around it. And this was an extremely successful model that was replicated all over the world. And another thing that we notice is that the city is on a river. So of course the river was bringing uh, the possibility of irrigation to the, this otherwise rather uh, dry region. And that the city is also dominated by a large, that's actually a temple complex. And in fact, the temple was not only the spiritual center of the city, but it was also the administrative center. So the temple gathered in the grain from the countryside offered it to the gods in the ziggurat, the famous ziggurat of Ur, if some of you have heard of that. They stored it in this large granary and then baked it in the bakery and then distributed it through the city through the course of the year. So if we were going to say, okay, how do the first cities in the world feed themselves? We would say they were city-states uh, that were dominated by what we would now call a large centralized food distribution hub. And as I say, this was a very successful model that was uh, repeated all over the world. Um, you're looking at Athens here, um, and Athens was also a city state, which means it was a, a, an urban core surrounded by farmland, exactly the same kind of model. Um, and I've gone to the Greeks here because the Greeks were the first people to directly address the question of how to feed a city. Um, now, if you think about back to the hunter gatherers, they were just kind of living in, well, I call it living in the larder. They were literally living in the landscape that fed them. But once we started living in cities, we start to see the beginning of a duality. Um, and this is expressed, this is Aristotle you're looking at here. And it's expressed by his term, uh, political animals. He called humans political animals, um, if you know that term. And what I love about this term is that it expresses this duality very clearly. So, you know, we are social beings, we need to live together. And if you live in a city, obviously that's perfect uh, for socializing and for being political. But on the other hand, we are also animals. And this means that we also need nature. Um, and so the question, both for Plato and for Aristotle, was how do we solve our dual needs for both society and nature? And they came up with this idea of oikonomia, 
Now, oikonomia just means household management. And the idea was that the ideal arrangement in a city would be that every citizen would have a house in the city and a farm in the countryside just outside the city and the farm would feed the house. And this is economia or household management. So the house is self-sufficient. And of course, if every citizen has this arrangement, then the city is self-sufficient. And both Plato and Aristotle thought this was a very good idea because if the city was self-sufficient, then it could also be politically independent. And they both said, okay, well, how big can the city be um, and still maintain this kind of arrangement? And they both agreed, oh, it has to actually stay quite small. Um, so the ideal size of a city was one that had enough people living there to have you know, the, all the offices of state and all the different trades represented, but was also small enough to be able to feed itself. And this became an incredibly powerful idea in subsequent utopian thinking. Um, in a way, I think this is the, the most beautiful image that sums up this relationship. I don't know whether some of you know it. It's Ambrogio Lorenzetti's Allegory of the Effects of Good Government, uh, painted in Siena in the 14th century. Um, and this image is, is actually huge. It's about 20 meters across. Um, and it sits on one wall in the town hall of Siena. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's sort of showing Siena itself and uh, the landscape that feeds the city. Um, and if you look closely, you can see that the image is really all about food um, because you can see huntsmen, a group of huntsmen leaving the city to maybe go and shoot a deer or something. You can see asses with grain on their backs entering the city, a pig walking to market. You can see the landscape itself is effectively artificial. It's been modified to feed the city. And then inside the city, you can see a flock of sheep wandering around, a woman with a basket of eggs on her head and so on. So you realize that this, this large wall in the middle of the image, which looks like a barrier, is actually a membrane and that constantly passing through it are people, and food and animals and trade and so on. And then you understand that the real message of this image, uh, as the title suggests, Allegory of the Effects of Good Government, is that that is the job of the uh, councillors sitting in the chamber. Their job is to maintain this balance between the city and the countryside, because without it, the city can't thrive. Um, and I love this image. And as I say, it's a very unusual image. In fact, I don't know of any images anywhere else like it. And I think part of the reason for that is that it's very rare in history that we've had this ideal balance between the city and the countryside. I mean, indeed, if we look at the typical balance between a city and its countryside today, it's almost the direct opposite of this kind of relationship. So, you know, on the left, you can see my home city of London, where I'm talking to you from today. And on the right hand side, you can see the kind of landscapes that feed London. Um, and we all know about this now. I mean, they're talking about it at COP26. You know, the fact that food and farming account for something like 30% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and also are responsible for a sort of a degrading of the rural landscape because actually farming like this in this very efficient way in big monocultures is very damaging to the land. Um, you know, you probably wouldn't want to paint that kind of countryside and stick it on your town hall, um, on the wall of your town hall. Now I call this the urban paradox. And the reason is, if you remember back to when I was just talking about Aristotle's description of us as political animals, that, you know, the question of how we bring society and nature together has just got more and more difficult to resolve as cities have got bigger and there have been more of us on the planet. And what's actually happened is that more and more of us are now living in cities. And so we're getting further and further away from the landscapes that feed us both mentally and physically. Um, and this is a real problem. So the paradox is how do we bring these two things closer together? Now, 
you know, one question is how on earth did we get here? And I just want to go on a little historical journey to try to explain it. Before uh, the railways, uh, basically cities were limited um, to the size they could grow uh, by geography, because it was not only a question of how you could grow enough food, grain being the most important food, to feed the city, but also how could you transport it? How could you bring it into the city? And of course, this all changed in the 19th century with the arrival of the railways, because railways allowed you for the first time to transport food very rapidly over long distances. And so I call this like goodbye geography, you know, and three key things change at this point. The first is that food, which had been visible because animals used to walk into the city, as we've just seen in that Lorenzetti image, you know, now they're going to be slaughtered outside the city and they're going to come in as dead meat. So food becomes invisible. The second thing is that cities are no longer constrained, so they can grow any size or place. And the third is that politicians, who up to this point have been responsible for feeding people in the city, now hand over that responsibility to the food industries. And these are three major consequences that we're still dealing with today. So this just shows you graphically what happened to London after the railways came. Uh, it very rapidly expanded to become, you know, the, the world's first sort of true modern metropolis that you couldn't possibly just feed from one or two little markets in the middle. So it really is the sort of the beginning of urbanity as we know it today. Urban sprawl, if you like. And at the same time, we see the rural hinterland being transformed. So this is the American Great West, huge area of prairie land that in before the railways was inhabited by 60 million bison, it's estimated. Uh, obviously lots of Native American tribes. When the railways came, the bison was slaughtered. The uh, Native Americans were moved off to reservations. Um, not much was done with the meat. People just wanted to clear the land so that they could do this, to grow grain on a scale that had never been seen before. And in fact, it's the first time in history that there's been more grain than people could actually eat. And of course, when you have so much grain, people started to get inventive um, and they came up with the uh, idea of feeding that excess grain to animals, to cattle specifically. Um, this is the so-called Chicago Union stockyards, uh, which were handling up to 17 million cattle every year. Um, and the cattle were fed on grain, fattened up on grain, uh, and then processed in these slaughterhouses, huge slaughterhouses. So it really is the beginning of industrial livestock production and the beginning of quote unquote cheap meat. Now, of course, we know that there is no such thing as cheap food, um, but you know, at this time it would seem people really thought that they had solved the problem of how to eat. Of course, we now know that uh, this is a ecological catastrophe on many levels, not least because actually, um, it, as, as the famous dust bowl illustrated, you can't just turn natural grassland into monocultural uh, grain production without consequences. And, and one of the first consequences was uh, the fact that the soil was lost, it blew away in the uh, catastrophic uh, dust bowl of the 1930s. Um, and this was really the beginning of the conversation about how we could feed the world, uh, whether we could carry on doing this sort of monocultural production. Uh, that's Justus Liebig, who was the German chemist who first realized that the key nutrients that plants needed nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus, NPK, uh, which <clears throat> are created by using the Harbour Bosch process, which fixes atmospheric nitrogen. Um, which allows us to grow in this way to sort of, if you like, feed plants on fast food, uh, which is effectively what artificial fertilizers do. Or the other camp that was saying, no, this is crazy, because actually the basis of plant health, this is Albert Howard, the father of the organic movement. He was saying, actually, the basis of plant health is in a living soil where the plants form direct roots with sol fungi and they feed sugars to the fungi and the fungi feed them micronutrients. And this is the basis of plant health and therefore the basis of our health if we're going to eat the plants. 
Um, and of course, this is a, an argument that still rages today as well. In fact, the organic lobby were winning, but unfortunately this happened. And of course, during wartime, what matters is growing as much food as possible, uh, not sort of seeing a long-term uh, nurturing of the soil. And so we went down this chemical road and of course, you know, 70 years later, this is where what is going global as a model. So we've come a long way, you know, we've gone from being hunter gatherers to farming, to using fossil fuels, living in cities. And now there's all this question about our future. Are we going to be growing lab meat? Are we going to have crazy kind of, you know, farms in cities? And what's gonna to happen to us? You know, we've gone from living in nature to being craft space, to working with machines, and now the machines, uh, it seems, are going to take over many of our jobs. So there's a huge question about where we're going, what is a good life? And as you can see, none of this is sort of would have been possible without this evolution in the way we eat. So there's a profound connection between the way we feed ourselves and the way we live. Now, my argument is, as I've said several times already, that there is no such thing as cheap food. Um, and this you know, slide just illustrates the point. As I mentioned before, we've got about a third of global farmland is lost or degraded because of this kind of farming. About a third of greenhouse gas emissions are associated with uh, food and farming and the deforestation associated with that. Um, about 70% of fresh water is used in farming. We have diet related disease and obesity. Zoonotic pandemics like COVID are partly an externality of the way we eat. Uh, we're wasting a lot of food because we don't value it. We're feeding grain to animals, which is wasteful. We're spending 10 calories of energy for every calorie we consume. And of course, we're killing off insect and bird life. So we're actually in a sixth mass extinction. So we can't afford to carry on eating like this uh, is the shorthand. Um, and unfortunately, this model is going global because, uh, as I mentioned briefly before, politicians have ceded responsibility for feeding us over to the food industry. And of course, food industries are interested in making money. They're not interested in making us healthy and they're not that interested in, you know, uh, treating nature uh, in the long term with respect either. So we have a crisis. And the question, of course, is what are we going to do about it? Um, I love this question. This is the English architect, Cedric Price. Um, and he said, Technolo technology is the answer, but what is the question? Um, and I think this is absolutely what we have to ask ourselves. We've got here, you know, we've got amazing technology. We've come a long way from being hunter gatherers, but what have we lost along the way? You know, are we really leading good lives now? Or is there some hint from our past about how we could live better. And I actually call this the neo-geographical age because I think we've lived, uh, you know, in a, for 200 years, thanks to fossil fuels, we've lived as though geography did not matter. And now it really matters again. So we have to rethink our idea of a good life. And my belief is that food is an ideal way to do that. In fact, of course, this is not a new idea. As I've already explained, the Greeks were asking the very same question, what does an ideal city look like? How could it feed itself? And as I also mentioned, this has been a very consistent topic through utopian thought. So Thomas More's Utopia of 1516 suggested that London should be replaced with a series of networked independent city-states. And Ebenezer Howard's Garden Cities model which you might have heard of is really just Thomas More with Railways. It's a series of linked uh, independent city-states of limited size. And actually Ebenezer Howard talked about the town country magnet, uh, which was in a way his way of addressing what I call the urban paradox of how you bring society and nature together. And in fact, this is why I invented the word Zootopia, because Utopia, which is our greatest tradition of thinking in a multidisciplinary way about what a good society is, um, actually is a joke word. It either means a good place or no place. And I think uh, this is very depressing to have a tradition that's idealistic but can't actually exist. 
Um, and so I thought, well, food shapes our world. We live in a world shaped by food. Why don't we use food uh, as a way of asking all of these questions instead? Um, and that's why I came up with the word Cytopia. So Cytopia is really a food based, real life, practical alternative to utopia. And if we think through food and we ask the question of what is a good life through the lens of food, you know, then we have a series of choices in effect. You know, do we feed animals on grain, which makes them sick by the way, because uh, cows evolved to eat grass, which by the way is also why we evolved with cows in the first place, because we can't eat grass. Um, or do we let them eat grass, you know, as part of regenerative farming systems? Do we leave the city to get our food in the name of efficiency, or do we use food to animate public space, you know, to talk to our neighbors and so on? Do we take time for food? So if I tell you that one in five meals in America is now eaten in a car, I mean, that hopefully should give you some idea of how crazy, you know, the direction we're going in, that we're too busy to eat. Um, you know, do we take time to enjoy food? Indeed, as many people lucky enough to have the space to do it uh, have done under lockdown. So we have many choices, but the question is, which of these actually is going to make us happy? Which of these is actually going to balance our lives with that of the planet? And I think it comes down to different philosophies in a sense. You know, this, is, this girl is drinking Soylent. I don't know whether you've heard of it, but it's a kind of food replacement substance that was invented by a, a tech techie guy called Rob Reinhardt uh, in Silicon Valley. The idea is that, you know, you just drink it, you don't have to worry about cooking or shopping or food, and then you can just, you're just free to do whatever you like. Or actually, do we go in exactly the opposite direction and think, well, you know, the fact that we have to eat means that we, you know, can have really enjoy this and we can make our own bread or we can pickle, or we can grow our own food and so on. And this really is the essence of a good life. And here they are, you know, the sort of Rob Reinhardt, the guy I was just talking about um, on the left here, you know, he, a quote from him is worrying about something, something as simple as food in the digital age is weird. Now, this is really sort of epitomizes for me the technological mindset that you kind of hack your way out of all the problems in life. Or we can embrace life and we can build our idea of a good life around uh, necessity, which is really what Epicurus was saying when he said self-sufficiency is freedom. That if we, our bodies are programmed to give us pleasure, if we satisfy our bodily needs and growing your own food and sharing it with friends is really, you know, the heart of a good life. And by the way, um, I'm, I'm, I'm with Epicurus on this one. I think it's important, of course, to recognize that there is no one size fits all solution. So, you know, a lot of the conversation around climate change is that, oh, you know, eating meat is bad and plants are good and so on. But actually that's not true. It depends on the context. So I would certainly say that industrial livestock production is bad. But actually, you know, certain people around the world rely on cattle for their livelihoods. And also in areas where it'd be very difficult to grow grain, such as the Alps, it makes perfect sense to have livestock, especially if they're part of a regenerative farming system. And of course, you know, there are other parts of the world where we've created very different ways of living in a landscape. And I think this is also something very critical to the idea of a good life going forward is that we have to recognize that it's going to be different depending on where you are. Um, but you know, historically what food culture itself is, is a solution to living well in a specific place. It's also about valuing food and it's slightly ironic that it tends to be during a crisis when we remember the true value of food. So London during the war, uh, Havana after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Detroit after the cars left. These are all moments when people remember the value of food, they started growing it again, and they formed food networks. Now I'm not saying that people should be forced to grow food, but I am saying that when you remember the true value of food, you start to see its power to create societies and connections and actually to be the basis of a better life. Um, and it's also partly about democratizing our food system. So I talked about the amount of uh, power that the food industries now have. 
Well, our food industry at the moment, our food system looks like this diagram on the left, where there's very few, you know, there are some farmers, some consumers, and very few supermarket buyers joining those two together. And really, if we want to live in a democracy, we need a food system that looks more like the one on the right, where the roots and the branches are joined up. And this uh, introduces the idea, I mean, this wonderful phrase of Carlo Petrini's. Carlo Petrini is the founder of the slow food movement. He calls it co-producing, which is basically not just being passive receivers of food, but actually working directly with those who feed us and getting involved actually in the food system. So we can, for example, join a community supported agriculture farm, CSA, where you pay the farmer to feed you ahead of time, maybe go and work on the farm or join a food co-op uh, where again, citizens just work four hours a month um, and then do direct deals with local farmers. Or, you know, small scale farmers can join uh, cooperatives or form cooperatives, which gives them more, more of a voice in the bigger picture. Or, you know, cities can support like food courts in Singapore, structures that allow small scale family businesses to operate within them. So there's many, many examples of these kinds of uh, ways of, you know, as it were, creating a much more integrated social food system. I'm an architect by training, so obviously I'm very interested in the way food shapes the, the spaces we live in and, and particularly uh, cities in their hinterlands. <clears throat> and in fact, there's a growing recognition that we need to sort of make space for food in cities again, you know, whether it's for growing on roofs or farmers markets, um, supporting local infrastructure such as family abattoirs, uh, preserving wholesale markets like this one in Nairobi or you know, even having sort of more industrialized food growing like vertical farms in the city fringes. As I've mentioned several times, I think that debate between chemical or organic agriculture is over. I think we have to go back to farming with nature, which means farming with the soil. And there are many amazing examples of how we can do this. It's a growing movement, a very rapidly growing movement, agroforestry, forest gardens that mimic forests, uh, mob grazing, which mimics what the bison used to do in the American Great West, instead of moving as herds, which fertilizes the soil and moves the, the nutrition around within the, the ecological system, uh, which is what nature does. Um, and that's how we should raise meat um, if we're going to eat meat, which I believe we should, uh, but smaller amounts, but higher quality. And importantly, not plowing the land. So the those living connections can form between the plants and the soil fungi. And I think it's also about bringing the city and the countryside closer together. This of course is a fundamental uh, goal of utopianism as I've already mentioned, but it doesn't have to be the fried egg that I described. It can be in any shape. So for example, we can preserve the countryside. So when cities grow, they grow in star shapes. So you have the country still close to the city or we can post fit existing cities with productive uh, orchards and micro farms sort of to cr create sort of green ribbons out to the countryside. Or we can, you know, maximize the amount of food that's created around the city and link it directly to the city. Um, or we can incorporate food in our plans for future cities as the Dutch architects MVRDV are doing in Almera in the Netherlands. So, of course, these are all ways of maintaining, going back to that idea of that Lawrence Setti picture that I showed you of Siena, of balancing society and nature and bringing city and country together. Um, and there are many examples of this already around the world. Um, I call these landscapes for human and non-human flourishing, because obviously there is no human flourishing without non-human flourishing, i.e. nature. And we have to find ways of living well within our ecological means and also coexisting with non-humans, uh, other creatures, birds, insects, you know, the, all the non-human inhabitants of the world. Um, and this is a sort of new way of imagining how we can occupy the landscape. So Zootopia is just the idea that if we look at the world through the lens of food, 
We can ask all the big questions. What is a good life? How should we share? How do we rebalance our relationship with nature? And all the questions that utopians ask, but we can do it through the lens of food. And really my ideal image I want to leave you with is this one. It's basically what a good society looks like. It's one in which everyone eats well, which is what our ancestors did. We evolved, as I said, around the fire and through the sharing of food. And we're still very good at sharing food because when we're with friends and even with strangers, but around a, a table, we understand the true value of food. So I'm proposing that we value food again, that we put the true value back in food uh, and that we adjust our economies uh, to allow for that. So we need tax reform so people can afford to eat well. We need land reform so people can farm and live close to nature. And it really is the beginning of a food-based revolution. Um, and we can't have utopia, but I do believe if we value food and rethink the way we live through it, we can have a really good sitopia, which is actually very close to utopia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gracias, eh, Caroline, en cara que es un fe que realicen diariamente, que forma parte de la nuestra vida, es que vamos a arribar al món. La mayoría no son conscientes del poder que tienen los alimentos, que es también la nuestra alimentación. De cómo definís en la sociedad, en los espacios que vivimos, en nuestro presente y también, obviamente, en nuestro futuro. Podría explicar tan a las personas que se acompañan hoy como a las personas. Maria, Maria, I'm so sorry. I 